In the history of credit markets, AAA had never failed. So what, what that spawned was a seizure in the commercial paper markets because everybody who traded commercial paper suddenly thought, uh-oh, if AAA paper can fail, which up until then had never been known, I don't want to be buying any paper no matter what it's rated at. Because I could be buying AAA paper from somebody in good faith today, and I could find out overnight that it failed too. So what it did is it, is it caused a seizure in the credit markets. And the paper market seized up. The interbank lending market seized up because interbank uh, banks didn't even want to lend to one another over on an overnight basis or on a one-month or one-week basis because they were afraid they might lend money to somebody who's holding a whack of this AAA paper that fails. It sounds for all the world like the end of a um, game of musical chairs where everybody doesn't, everybody's afraid they're not going to have a seat to sit on, and so the, that lack of trust breaks down. Proverbially, that's exactly what happened. So the credit market seized shut in the third quarter of 2007. And what that means is no banks were doing trading with other banks. The interbank market went dead because nobody wanted to lend. or, or so, so now we go back into these interest rate derivatives because, you see, I worked on a trading desk of interest rate derivatives back in the late 80s when the SNL crisis hit. And I know what happens on a trading desk when there's a credit freeze. Uh, you stop trading, and the market seizes shut. Well, these OTC derivatives that I was mentioning earlier, namely the FRA and the interest rate swap, they happen to be credit instruments. Because when you buy an FRA, you're synthetically borrowing money. When you sell an FRA, you're synthetically lending money. And that's a credit, that's a credit activity. And what I'm telling everybody who wants to listen is that in the interbank market, nobody was trading any of that stuff, except for, lo and behold, as history, and you can, go, you can go and actually read about this when you go to the Office of the Controller of the Currencies website, and you pull up the quarterly derivatives report for 2007 for Q, and, and then contrast Q2 against Q3 against Q4, you will notice that J.P. Morgan's uh, swap book in the less than one year period advanced from about $24 trillion up to $32 trillion and then receded back to $24 trillion from the second quarter to the third quarter to the fourth quarter. The bloat in Q3 because it rolled off in the next quarter, identifies the product. And that product was FRAs. But we just, we just, we just went through the exercise that th this can't happen because there was nobody trading except J.P. Morgan, who did $8 trillion worth in three months. Yeah, that doesn't seem like it makes any sense if there's no trading partners. That's right. But you see, what that does do is it identifies the counterparty for J.P. Morgan as a non-bank entity. Okay? The only entity on the planet with the heft to do $8 trillion worth of those trades with J.P. Morgan is the U.S. Treasury. And then if you overlay what happened to three-month uh, 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 interest rates, in that time period, in the third quarter of 2007, that happens to be when three-month interest rates, T-bill rates in particular, dropped about 250 basis points in two days. And that identifies which way around the players were and what was going on. The U.S. Treasury was selling uh, FRAs to J.P. Morgan at rates lower than Treasury bills. To hedge those trades and lock in a profit on them, J.P. Morgan was then turning around and buying Treasury bills. And that's what caused the Treasury bills to cascade. That's effectively how they drove interest rates, the short-term rates. It's one thing to say you're going to make rates low. It's one thing to, to legislate the Fed funds or the overnight rate down. 
But it's another thing to make make market participants willing to uh, buy three month T bills that are supposed to be set in open market. Well, the way you do it is you use you use the FRAs. You sell somebody uh, if you're the U.S. Treasury, you sell a you sell a commercial bank the FRA at a rate lower than the T bill, and then they go and buy the T bill to hedge it. And they did this. So effectively, U.S. monetary policy was being instituted through the trading desk of J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan knew before anyone that rates were going to zero because they were the ones. You see, and this this all came about because the people in the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve were panicking because the, inter the interbank market was seized up. And if the interbank market remained seized up, that would have meant that the U.S. dollar's days were done as a world's reserve currency because it would have shown it would have shown the u.s dollar to have been an, in, an inadequate uh, 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 you know and unsuitable to be the world's reserve currency and unworkable so this is the way they reacted to the seas and the panic this is this is what they did this is how they drove rates to zero short-term rates this is how they got them to zero and, and and what this does is it opens up all kinds of issues about uh, uh, you know whether J.P. Morgan was front running this stuff. Whether you know it's it it just creates a complete and utter nightmare. And uh, I mean so that so, so that's I mean you asked me to, to cite an example of how these things were used or when they were first initially used. And that's when that's when they were first used. So the, so what was the upshot of all this? Well, the upshot of all this was initially. When, 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 when the Treasury did the FRA trades with Morgan, making them a captive buyer of the T-bills, the T-bill rates plummeted. But the, the uh, Euro-dollar LIBOR rates, because that's, that says where banks want to lend or are willing to lend money, banks still didn't want to lend money because there was risk in lending money. You could give, give a, a, a counterparty the money and they might not pay it back. So... And, and, that, and that was borne out because as the T-bill rates began to sewer down, LIBOR, and LIBOR is uh, set by the Eurodollar future rate in Chicago, the three-month Eurodollar future rate, uh, that rate actually started to back up as the T-bill rates were sewering. So you've got, you've got the T-bill rates going down, and you've got the Eurodollar, Eurodollar future rate going up, and that... The difference in those two products is called the TED spread, and the T stands for Euro dollar, or sorry, the T stands for T bill, and the ED stands for Euro dollar future contract, and and the spread between the two is called the TED spread, and that spread normally historically trades in a very narrow range, and what happened because the Treasury was in the market forcing short rates to zero, that spread blew out to historic highs. And it was when the TED spread blew out, that's when, that's when mainstream uh, financial writers said, there's something wrong, your LIBOR looks broken. LIBOR wasn't broken. LIBOR was doing exactly what it should do when there were dubious credits in the market. They were, they were, the banks were raising rates. The reason they were saying LIBOR looked broken was because the euro dollar future wasn't following the T-bill rate down. And, and, it, and there was no reason for it to fall because the only reason, the only reason that the T-bill rate was crashing down was because the Treasury was doing surreptitious trades, making, making the banks buying the T-bills captive buyers, showing them no risk trades. So this huge manipulation on a global scale was... No, it was, that wasn't really on a global scale at that point, but it had global, global ramifications. But the way it started off with, it was just a panic, and it was just, it was a panic, and it, and it was an attempt to, it was an attempt to jolt. It was, they, were, they were basically administering, this is the equivalent of taking, taking the electric paddles and, and trying to shock the, uh, uh, the the money market back to life, and this is exactly what they were doing. Except except there there, there are side effects. You know, I think we 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 can all relate to 
uh, uh, you know, pharmaceutical commercials where they give you, uh, you know, they tell you how great the pharmaceutical is or the, the new pill and what it does for you or what it might do for you. And then they give you a list of side effects that might, might be worse than what you initially had that might be two or, two or three miles long. Well, in, in, in the case of this electroshock therapy to the money markets, uh, you know, the, the, the side effects were, were, were hundreds of miles long. And, you know, and they, they, include, they include everything from exposing, uh, uh, you know, ex well, geez, my God, they, they, they've, they've caused dislocations all over the place. And, and what they've done by artificially forcing rates to unnatural levels is they've, they've instituted a, a complete new round of misallocation of scarce capital. 